Well, I'm back, and so is a Minikit. Come along, and let's break down our Remaster Block Constructed deck. Welcome to the Signature Spell Bomb, where we grow the Oathbreaker format with our budget deck series, The Oath Breakdown. On The Oath Breakdown, I break down a budget Oathbreaker deck that's designed to introduce new players to the format. Then I build the deck back up so you have a better idea of how to play the deck and why certain cards made my list. If you enjoy Oathbreaker content, then please support us by like, sharing, and subscribing, and turning on notifications so you know when we have new content for you. Today's deck is Nissa Blocked. It is a Nissa Stalwart of the Elements deck for under $25 that is built entirely out of the Arena exclusive set, a Minikit Remastered. Let's start out by breaking down our deck's Oathbreaker. Nissa, Steward of Elements, costs X, a green, and a blue, and comes into play with X loyalty. If we plus two Nissa, we get to scry two cards. If we zero her, we look at the top card of our library, and if it's a land or a creature card, we can put it directly onto the battlefield if it's converted to mana cost, costs less than the number of loyalty counters on Nissa, or we can minus six her and untap up to two target lands we control, and they become 5-5 elemental creatures with flying in haste until the end of turn, and there still lands. This Nissa is highly adaptable and was chosen by a Twitter poll to lead this deck. Her cost will allow us to play her early or late game and still get some decent advantage. Her plus two ability will help us control our draws, and it also lets us set up her zero ability for some major value. Her minus six will give us some incidental mana ramp and some free big sky beaters for a turn, but that's a rather high loyalty cost for a very little advantage, so we won't plan on using it that often. Our signature spell this time is Hour of Promise. It costs four and a green and is a sorcery. We search our library for two land cards and put them onto the battlefield tap. Then, if we control three or more deserts, we make two 2-2 two -two black zombie creature tokens. Hour of Promise is excellent ramp, and the extra benefit of free zombies is nice. So that's what's in our command zone. Let's dig into this deck's game plan. To be quite honest, this deck was designed to come out during a Minikit Remasters release, but due to some personal life issues, it's been put off till now. This deck was more of a dare than a strict game plan, so we're gonna do our best with what a Minikit Remasters gives us and just build some janky fun. Now, how do we win with this deck? Well, our goal is to have a good time with this challenge, so we're going to win by just making a deck that feels fun to play. It is going to mostly focus on an easy-to-play aggro strategy. Now, this deck is jank with a capital J, and because of that, it has a power level of 4. Now, let's get into the actual deck breakdown. Let's start with the ramp that will help this deck run in... Just Deserts. Oshira's Cultivator costs 1 green and is a 0-3 creature. If we pay 2 and tap her, we can sacrifice her to search her library for a basic land card and put it onto the battlefield tapped. Naga Vitalis for 1 and a green is a 1-2 Naga Druid. If we tap her, we can add 1 mana to our mana pool of any type of land we could control produces. Shefet Monitor for 5 and a green is a 6-5 Lizard. If we cycle it for 3 and a green, then we also get to search our library for a basic land card or a desert card and put it onto the battlefield, untap. And finally in this section, Rona's Monument costs 3 colorless. It makes all our green creature spells cost 1 less to cast. And whenever we cast any creature spell, we can give one of our creatures plus 2 plus 2 and trample till end of turn. This is going to help our limited aggro strategy. In section two, we're going to focus a little bit more on controlling the top of our deck so that Nissa, you know, zero loyalty ability won't fail us most of the time. In Saw That Coming, Naga or Oracle costs three and a blue. It's a 2 4 Naga Cleric. When it enters the battlefield, we get to look at the top four cards of our library. We put any number of them into our graveyard and the rest back on top in any order. There are some edge cases where putting creatures into our graveyard is a positive thing, but also knowing what's on the top of our library will know, let us know when we can use our Nissa. Shifter Worm for five and two green is a 7 7 with Trample. When it enters the battlefield, we scry three. Then we reveal the top card of our deck and we'll gain life equal to that card's converted mana cost and we do have some cards that have higher mana cost than they would first appear. Supreme Will for Tuna Blue will let us counter target spell unless its controller pays three, which is great, or we can look at the top four cards of our library, put one of them into our hand, and the rest on the bottom of our library in any order. 
Next, we have Strategic Planning for One in a Blue. We look at the top three cards of our library, put one into our hand, and the rest into our graveyard. Lastly, we have Reason to Believe. The Reason side costs one blue mana and allows us to scry three, and Believe costs four and a green and can only be played from our graveyard. We look at the top card of our library and we may put that card onto the battlefield if it's a creature, and if we can't put that card onto the battlefield, we put it into our hand. The beauty of Reason to Believe is it costs one blue for Reason and five for believe but double-sided cards like this actually count as both costs added up and that's great for cards like shift or worm now i have a simple question for my viewers what is better than controlling the top of your deck well drawing of course especially when you know what you're going to draw let's figure out how we're going to get some extra value in kefnet provides so first up, we have River Hopo. For a green and a blue, it's a 1-3 bird with flying. If we pay three and a green and a blue, we can gain two life and draw a card. Seeker of Insight is one and a blue. It's a 1-3 human wizard. We can tap it to draw a card and discard a card. This card filtering is sometimes very helpful. We can only use that ability, though, if we've already cast a non-creature spell this turn. Champion of Wits for two and a blue is a 2-1 Naga Wizard. When it enters the battlefield, we get to draw cards equal to its power, and then we discard two. It also has Eternalize for 5 and 2 blue. Next, we have Kefnet the Mindful. For 2 and a blue, it's a 5-5 Flying Indestructible God. It counter attack or block unless we have 7 or more cards in our hand. And if any time we can pay 3 and a blue, we get to draw a card, and then we return a land card we control to its owner's hand if we so choose. 6 cents costs 1 green. We enchant a creature, and whenever the enchanted creature deals combat damage, to a player, we draw a card. Cartouche of Knowledge for one in a blue says enchanter creature you control. When enters the battlefield, draw a card, and the enchanter creature gets plus one, plus one, and flying, and that's just some decent evasion. Lastly in this section, we have Mouth and Feed. The Mouth side costs two and a green, and will create us a 3-3 three, three green hippo token. And the Feed side can only be played from our graveyard, costs three and a green, and will let us draw a card for each creature we control with power three or greater. Now, since this deck does have its limitations, it's only fair that we obstruct our opponents just a little bit to keep the game fair. And I'm going to tell you what cards we use to do that in Cunning Obstructionist. Manglehorn for Tuna Green is a 2-2 creature. When it enters the battlefield, we destroy target artifact, and from that point on, our opponent's artifacts will enter the battlefield tapped. Nimble Obstructionist for 2 and a blue is a 3-1 Flying Flash Bird Wizard creature. And if we cycle it for 2 and a blue, we can counter target activated or triggered ability we don't control. Perilous Vault for 4 colorless mana is the only board wipe in the deck. If we pay 5 and tap it, we can exile it and all other non-land permanents. Unquenchable Thirst for 1 and a blue enchants a creature. When it enters the battlefield, if we control a desert or there's one in our graveyard, we can tap Enchant a creature, and that creature will not untap during its controller's untap step. Cartouche of Strength is 2 and a green. We have to enchant a creature we control, but when we do so, we can have that creature fight a creature controlled by one of our opponents, and it's going to give that creature plus one, plus one in Trample. Sensor for one in a blue will counter target spell unless its controller pays one, and if we ever just need some card draw, we can cycle it for one blue. This center's deliverance for one in a green will let us destroy target artifact, and we can cycle it for a green. Essence scatter for one in a blue will just let us counter target creature spell. Now moving on, we need to look at getting some damage through if we want to have a chance at winning. This next section is called All Be Damaged. First off, we have Resilient Kenra. For one in a green, it's a 2-2 Jackal Wizard. When it enters the battlefield, we can have target creature we control get plus X plus X till end of turn, where X is equal to Resilient Kenra's power, and it has Eternalize for four and two green. Slither Blade is a 1-2 Naga Rogue for one blue mana that can't be blocked. Rona's Stalwart for one in a green is a 2-2 Human Warrior. Whenever it attacks, we can exert it. If we do, it gets plus one, plus one, and can't be blocked by creatures with power two or less this turn. Spellweaver Eternal for one in a blue is a 2-1 Prowess Creature with Afflict. Aerial Guide for two in a blue is a 2-2 Drake with Flying. Whenever it attacks, we can have another target creature we control that's attacking gain flying, which is just great. It's extra evasion. Sidewinder Naga for Tuna Green is a 3-2 Naga Wizard. If we control a desert or there's a desert corner graveyard, it'll get plus 1, plus 0, oh, and trample. Majestic Matriarch for 4 and a green is a Chimera with power and toughness each equal to double the number of creatures we control. And at the beginning of each of our combats, it will gain flying, 
Double Strike, Death Touch, First Strike, Haste, Hexproof, Indestructible, Lifelink, Menace, Breach, Trample, or Vigilance if we have any other creatures in play that happen to have one of those keyword abilities. Throne of the God Pharaoh costs two colorless mana, and at the beginning of our end step, each opponent will lose life equal to the number of tapped creatures we control. So in this aggro strategy, it's good sometimes just to tap down our creatures, and if they survive combat, we're going to drain our opponents for a little more that they don't expect. I do have a few value creatures that didn't make this last section, but due to their value, it's easy to call them the Chosen. Though, to be fair, you don't really want to be the Chosen on a Minicat. Initiate's Companion costs 1 and a green and is a 3-1 cat. Whenever it deals combat damage to a player, we get to untap a target creature or land. By Zero of Tumbling Sands, for 2 and a blue is a 1-3 Human Cleric. We can tap it to untap another permanent. And if we cycle it for 1 and a blue, we can untap target permanent. Champion of Ronus for 3 and a green is a 3-3 Jackal Warrior. We may exert it when it attacks. If we do, we can take a creature card from our hand and put it directly onto the battlefield. Next, Quarry Hauler for 3 and a green. Enters the battlefield for each kind of counter on target permanent. We can either add another counter of that kind or remove a counter from it. Vizier of Many Faces for 2 and 2 blue is a 0 0 shapeshifter cleric. When it enters the battlefield, it becomes a copy of any creature on the battlefield, which allows us to make a duplicate of any of our opponent's awesome creatures. And if it dies for any reason, we can embalm it for 3 and 2 blue. Now, in our last section, I want to focus on one card, and this card will let us replay any creature in our army from our graveyard in the Eternals. God Pharaoh's Gift costs 7 colorless mana, and at the beginning of combat on our turn, we may exile a creature card from our graveyard. If we do, we create a token that's a copy of that card, except it's a 4-4 black zombie, and gains haste till end of turn. So, that's the cards in the main deck. Let's talk about the lands in the mana base. In this deck, we've got a couple cards that care about deserts, and many deserts are also good utility cards, so we're going to run them to help kind of round out our deck. Desert of the Embomitable and Desert of the Mindful both come into play tapped. They tap for one mana of their card, and we can cycle them for one and one mana of their color. Evolving Wilds can be tapped and sacrificed. We can search our library for a basic land card and put it onto the battlefield tapped, and then shuffle our library. Hapstep Oasis can be tapped for a colorless. It can be tapped for a green mana if we pay one life. And if we pay one and two green, we can sacrifice any desert we control to give target creature plus three plus three until end of turn, but only at sorcery speed. If New Rivulet does something very similar, we can tap it for a colorless. We can tap it for a blue mana, but only if we pay one life. And if we pay one in a blue and tap and sacrifice a desert we control, target player mills four cards. And finally, we have Scavenger Grounds. We can tap it for a colorless, pay two and tap it, and sacrifice a desert. And if we do, we exile all cards from all graveyards. And that will really help us with some strategies that involve, you know, maybe a little bit of grave robbing. Sunscored Desert. When it enters the battlefield, it deals one damage to target player or planeswalker, and we can tap it for a colorless. That's just good incidental damage. And then we're going to be running seven basic forests and six basic islands. Now that we have looked at all the cards in the deck, let's do a quick price check. Our deck prices on the channel include our Oathbreaker and the shipping cost, but not the cost of our basic lands, and are based on the best available prices on TCG Player at the time of recording. Since this is a special block constructed challenge, it's not worth it to compare to other decks on Oathbreaker Rec at this time. Our deck cost $23.75. If you want to see a breakdown of the deck cost, there will be a link posted in the description. Now this deck was built with a budget in mind and a special restriction of only using a Minikit Remastered cards. If you do like this deck and you want to upgrade it, I would suggest seeing what our veteran players suggest in the comments below or checking out other Nissa Steward of the Elements decks on OathbreakerRec.com to see what other clever game plans your fellow Oathbreakers came up with. If you want to support the channel, you can do so by shopping at TCGPlayer.com, Inked Gaming, or Teespring using our links in the comments below, and it really helps the channel. If you want to see more deck tech content from this channel, check out our Oath Breakdown playlist here. A huge thank you to my viewers, and a quick reminder, be like a planeswalker and show your loyalty by subscribing to the channel.